limitations. Uh, this is procurement reform. If uh, you think this is the flight to Seattle, you're in the wrong spot. <laughs> um, we actually have a great panel for you today. Uh, I thought I might uh, say a few words uh, about our moderator, Jim Kunder. Um, but before I do, let me just say that procurement, in fact, is the lifeblood of the government. Uh, whether it was blankets at Valley Forge or uh, carbines in uh, the Civil War to purchasing goods and services now, the U.S. government has done sometimes a good job, sometimes a less good job at uh, acquiring goods and services and expertise. The panel up here is a great panel. I'm going to let Jim introduce them, so let me first introduce Jim. I've known him for years. He was a senior official at USAID in a number of different capacities. He was in the U.S. Marine Corps for a while. He is now at the German Marshall Fund, where he has been a sage, a wonderful source of advice for all sorts, for many of us, including me. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get this panel started and turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Rodney. I really appreciate that kind of remarks. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, this is rural development in Sumatra. You're in the right panel, right? I mean, no. Okay. I saw somebody I knew was going to ask tough questions, and that's what I told him, you know, in hopes of getting him uh, to go on to the next room. There are some panels that you moderate that when you size them up, you say, wow, I'm really going to have to work hard, you know, to make this one exciting. But when I looked at the lineup they handed me here and knowing the interest, intense interest in the community in this topic, this is one of those panels where the moderator just sort of glides along on the surface. And I, I anticipate there'll be a lot of great uh, questions from all of you and a lot of great discussion. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, we do have a very distinguished panel. I'm not going to do biographies because I want to get to the substance. You all have the biographies. Uh, in, your, in your packet, and, and I encourage you to uh, look them over because we've got some very highly qualified individuals here. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist, beginning down at the end with Eric Postel, to make a couple of opening comments, um, uh, just a few minutes, to introduce the topic as they see it. And I've asked each of them to answer this particular question in 15 words or less. What is the biggest procurement issue facing the international development community today? Uh, we'll ask ourselves a couple questions up here, and I will then uh, open it up to the floor. Obviously, you see where the mics are. Uh, when we get to that portion of it, I'll ask you to identify yourself and, and make your, you, you know the old shtick, right? It's not the time for speeches, it's the time for a question. So uh, we'll go to that as quickly as possible. So let's get going. Uh, in what promises, I think, to be a very exciting discussion. And I'll ask Eric Postel to kick it off. Okay. Thanks, Jim, and uh, good morning, everyone. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, including some old friends and uh, new friends. And um, you know, it's also a pleasure because you all are devoting your whole lives to our shared endeavor uh, of development. And so it's a great chance uh, for me to learn from you, hear problems that you might have, and learn from my fellow colleagues on the panel. Um, one of the reasons why I'm uh, on this uh, panel is because seven years ago, as a couple folks in this room know, I was a member of this commission called the Health Commission. And in the back, starting on page 123, there's a 25-page paper that three of us wrote uh, called uh, Foreign Assistance Grant and Gra uh, Contract Procurement Processes. And so um, when they were putting the panel together, um, people thought it would be interesting for me to be up here having opened my big mouth on the outside of government and now being um, inside USAID to talk about um, what I've seen in that process. And to, to make that linkage, I actually pulled out last night that report, and I was looking at it, and I decided I would read two or three sentences which build on something that um, Ronnie said. Um, this is the first paragraph of that paper. The processes used to award foreign aid grants and contracts may at first appear to be unimportant topic for the commission to address. Many mistakenly believe that these processes are administrative matters of little intrinsic importance. We strongly disagree, and that's why I'm on the, this panel, and I'm pleased to see so many people here, because I actually think this is a very important part of our work. Um, 
And what I found since coming to government is that it's every bit as challenging as I expected and that the things that need uh, to be fixed, some of them require very high level um, actions, policy changes, um, changes in guidances, but a lot of it is basic day-to-day -day sort of blocking and tackling. You've got to put in the time, you've got to put in the work and grind it out. And um, that's as important. And all those little things eventually add up to some big things. So I would say that's my, my quick takeaway. So lastly, um, as far as my view on what the biggest challenge is, I think the biggest challenge is everybody working together to improve the procurement cycle times. Um, that, that's, they're way too long, and that is a shared um, uh, challenge across many, many different actors. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop, and I'm looking forward to this and learning and hearing from all of you. We're especially uh, fortunate to have Chris Tinning here with us from the Australian Embassy from Alsaid. Uh, as, you, as many of you know, Alsaid, probably the fastest growing international development donor agency and one that's doing a lot of dynamic things. So Chris, your shot. Thanks very much, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I guess we view procurement in the context of some of the broader changes that are happening within the Australian aid program, and one of those is growth. Uh, so you may be aware the Australian aid program in 2005 was less than $2 billion. It's now almost $6 billion, so that's a fairly rapid growth in the budget. And the second thing that's changing is the way that we do uh, business. So I guess uh, in the early 2000s, we did a lot of standalone projects uh, in the field, and um, we, we felt that that was not having the impact we wanted. It was having an impact on those particular um, projects, but it wasn't having the broader impact that we want on development. And I guess in a context where aid is an increasingly small part of the overall development picture and remittances are increasing, trade's increasing, developing countries' expenditures increasing, that changes the way that we felt uh, the aid program could make the greatest impact. So this is resulting in a lot more focus on partnerships for us. So we're, we're working a lot more through um, developing country government systems to try and have a greater impact on the overall picture rather than just on the particular projects. We're working a lot more in partnership with businesses and private sector organisations that are um, oriented towards development, and that includes mining companies and others that sort of have a, a large uh, uh, incentive, I guess, to uh, get the enabling environment right, and we work a lot with multilaterals, NGOs and others. So I guess, uh, that leads me to the, the big question, I guess, which is how uh, procurement processes and practices keep pace, I guess, with the evolution in, in aid and uh, the way that um, the overall development story is evolving. Well, let's move uh, quickly out of government. APT Associates, a major international contractor. We're really lucky to have uh, President Kathleen Flanagan here. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm pleased to be here. I'm going to speak less about APT Associates and more about the fact that I'm a proud member of the Coalition of International Development Contractors, the CIDC, um, an organization that together about 55 or 60 of us um, founded about two and a half years ago to begin a more deliberate dialogue with USAID, um, specifically the leadership there, on our role as inter international development contractors in the changing world of procurement and, and development. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to represent that group. I see a lot of my colleagues, both large, medium size, and small businesses in the audience today, and so I encourage you to speak out and um, add to my comments. Um, but I think that in the context of those discussions that we've had with the administrator, with Eric and his teams, um, with Deputy Secretary um, Steinberg and others about changes which are inevitable and that we um, obviously as key partners um, align with and will support. It's really about the role that the international development contractor has in this new world. What are the expectations for us? We've been partners at APT for 30 years and many of those folks in the room that I see have been long-term collaborative and successful and accountable partners with USAID over, over a long period of time. But what is the, are the expectations of us in this new world? As you've emphasized to us, innovation, the role of science and technology increasing, uh, monitoring and evaluation and value for money and, and yeah, return on investment being key topics. 
how will those play out in the expectations of the roles, is specifically in procurements um, and in our partnership going forward? So I would say that's kind of our biggest question um, on, on my mind is sort of what, what will our role be? Um, we're now working with AUSAID um, and obviously continuing our role with, with USAID and this, this collaboration and partnership is also a welcome um, thing for us. So we'd like to know a little bit more about how that will play out. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Oxfam America has been heavily involved in this whole debate about procurement reform. Greg Adams. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jim. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to try to address your question. Um, I think it's a 12-word answer. Um, how do we maximize the power and influence of citizens in our development interventions? I really think that's the key challenge in the debate about procurement. Um, we all know the essential truth of development. We don't do development. Oxfam doesn't cause development. You say doesn't cause development. People and countries develop themselves. And the outcomes that we seek actually rest on citizens and governments being able to work in concert, being, citizens being able to hold their governments accountable, governments being able to provide the public goods and services that citizens need to be able to participate in the economy, um, live their lives with dignity and safety. So. If that compact is essentially something that exists within the country and is indigenous to the country, how do we, as outsiders, actually contribute in ways that help citizens achieve what they want to achieve and help governments meet their citizens' needs? If that's the essential challenge, there's a lot about our existing procurement model that is still built backwards. Too much of the accountability still goes backwards to Washington. Now, that's not to say that that accountability to Washington is not important. There's an important accountability pr uh, role for Congress to play, for the American taxpayer to play, to make sure that they're getting value for their dollars. But too often, those systems come at the expense of systems which actually build citizens in. And this, to us, is the, the real next frontier of procurement reform. Um, we've, we've shaken up the system a little bit at USAID in terms of the, the tools that you, you say development professionals have in the field to actually partner with a wider array of, of stakeholders. The question now is how do we actually build citizens into that, build those feedback loops so that more power and accountability actually flows directly to and from those citizens. Well, I was hoping you would all come to the exact same international <laughs> question so I could summarize it, uh, but I see, but, but, and actually what we've done here is show the, I think the many diverse uh, aspects of the, of the uh, procurement reform debate. L let me ask the panel a question. Um, and picking up a little bit on what Greg ended up with, what, how do we keep everyone involved in this? Citizens have a role to play in the developing country. Local governments have a role to play. Universities have a role to play. Contractors, small business, international foundations. How can procurement be improved so that we get all of the assets available to the table and avoid a sort of either or version of procurement reform. I, I worry sometimes that the USAID for, uh, forward reforms have been reduced to a linear zero sum game. You know, it's either the international contractors or it's local localized procurement. But in fact, it's a big circle of assets that are need to be devoted to poverty reduction and improvement of of humankind, how, how do we get everybody involved? How do we design a procurement system where the whole of nation, whole of world approach can be brought to bear? Who wants to take the first crack at that tiny little question? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathleen, I'll go, go first. Um, I, I think, and, and when I when I say we, I'm again representing CIDC and and my colleagues in the room. Um, who are contractors on a day-to-day -day basis out around the world. And I would say we're quite practiced, uh, um, honestly, at managing and coordinating coalitions of individuals and resources in, in any country um, to make sure we can have an impact on the problem that we've been asked to partner with USAID or any other donor in addressing. Um, almost every single one of our projects involves 
um, a majority of local staff um, staffing the projects, uh, universities, NGOs, local government coming together and other donors and, and funders in the coming together to think about what is the best solution to addressing the problem. Um, so I think you're right in saying we've got to continue this and we have to empower folks at the local level. We have to build capacity and, and sustain that capacity. Um, but I think over the years we've become quite practiced at that um, and welcome the opportunity to continue to, in, in, in more less of a coordinating role and more of a collaborative role, support our donors as they come together to. Kathleen, let me put you on the spot. So does that mean that we should just continue the model we have right now, or is there some new direction we should be going in? Um, I, I think USAID in particular has emphasized the importance of um, local capacity, local capacity building, and I think the contractors have responded in making sure that our teams um, are predominantly made up of locals and that the, the, the entire coalitions at the local level use uh, businesses, NGOs, um, and universities at the local level. So I would say um, continue that emphasis um, and more of the same um, now, but you know, that, that's been a, a changing um, lens over the last several years. Eric? So um, I think that the answer to that question is that you have to work in a lot of different ways um, to, to try to capture the whole breadth and depth of all the many people. I mean, as everybody in this room will remember, back about 50 years ago, there were about a couple dozen development actors. And I bet the, the, uh, the number of people at a conference like this would have fit in half this room. And that constituted the people that were working with the partner governments in all these developing countries. Now, it's completely different. There are literally thousands um, I happen to be on the campus of my alma mater a year ago, and in the graduating class of only uh, 600 kids, there were two startups while they were in school, two startups out of one campus on development. And this is the whole breadth and depth. I'm told that at Berkeley, the most popular class in the undergraduate campus is development, where they have more than 800 kids taking development courses. The whole thing has completely changed, not just in our country, in other developed countries, but also in developing countries. Hundreds of organizations involved in many different aspects of the process. So you, you want to try to capture all that energy. The, the, the local solutions, which is one aspect of USAID Forward, and it's frequently the one that is uh, discussed the most, but there are many other aspects of this. Uh, and I'll just mention um, the grand challenges, because one of the ways we're trying to do this is to try different things. And some will work better than others, but to try to capture that energy. So in, in the bureau that, uh, for which I'm responsible, we did a grand challenge in education. And you know that the typical IQC or contract that goes out about education typically will uh, attract a dozen on a, on a really big one, maybe a couple dozen bidders. For the grand challenge in education, which we're doing with AUSAID and with uh, NGO World Vision, so the three of us came together, that's one thing that's different. The second thing is we jointly designed it, we jointly procured it and evaluated and everything. We had more than 450 proposals from around the world. We gave 32 different grants, half of them went to overseas organizations, half of them uh, in developing countries and half were elsewhere. So I, I think that there's a, we have to try a lot of different things and there's a lot of different communities. Yes, it, it's a matter of having a lot of different tools and, and actors. Local organizations are part of it, big international um, contracting firms are part of it, big um, international um, NGOs are part of it, small startup NGOs, academic institutions, the Higher Education Solutions Network, all of these things are part of that. Mm -hmm. if, if anybody in the audience has not had a chance to look at the USAID website for these grand challenges for development, I strongly encourage you to do that. Very interesting mm -hmm. program. Uh, Chris, how does all yeah. this look from Canada? Yeah, so uh, I think we'd certainly agree the picture's far more complex than it, it was 
20, 30 years ago, and I guess that complexity uh, leads to a whole lot of different new approaches. And we're, we're part of Grand Challenges, we're part of, uh, of partnerships with a lot of bilateral donors, multilateral donors, uh, NGOs, business groups. And that, that's a far, obviously far more complex uh, in terms of our systems internally as well. And I guess there has been an evolution in the way that uh, we deal with uh, the private contractors uh, within our aid program. And part of that evolution is we've completely untied our aid program. So firms from anywhere in the world can bid and that creates uh, better competition, better ideas. Um, and we'd, we'd like to see more of that competition uh, um, from, from US firms who I think have a lot to, uh, to offer. Um, but it, it means, I guess, that it, it isn't as easy to, if you're a traditional uh, contracting firm, it's not as easy to do business with us because it is a more complex picture and it's not just about delivering standalone projects, it's about contractors playing a, a role within broader programs. There might be contractors working within uh, a government to provide technical assistance for a broader uh, program that's working within a government system implemented with a multilateral, uh, with NGOs doing some of the service delivery. I mean, these sort of more complex models um, result in better outcomes from our perspective, but also, I guess, it's more difficult to, uh, to, for, for traditional contracting firms to, uh, to be doing business with us, and, uh, and that creates some complexities from a procurement perspective as well. Greg, have you been satisfied with what you've heard so far? Does it sound like progress not, to you? Not really. Um, because I don't. But I love asking provocative questions <laughs> like that. Um, I'm, I'm not as sanguine that we've, we've figured out this question of um, really how we shift power to local actors. Um, rather than just include them in our existing processes, when are we going to be willing to actually immerse ourselves into their processes um, and, and really try to strengthen those? That's, that's the real challenge flipping that power dynamic and we're still not, I think, as, as a community and an industry committed enough to it. But I don't think it's, it, it, what has, what has um, impelled us up to this point has been, I think, a, a, an interest in doing this because we believe it's the right thing to do, but increasingly, increasingly the marketplace is actually changing and so we're going to have to do it in order to respond to what local partners actually need and want. And increasingly, the successful development implementers, be they government, nonprofit, or for-profit, are going to have to look more to the local actors to define what the mission is, to measure the results, and to actually um, hold the power of accountability. Because until we get there, we're not actually going to be making the kind of contributions we need um, to be able to actually make this this huge shift, to be able to, you know, if the new goal is to eradicate poverty in the next 17 years, we are not right now doing the kinds of things we need to do to get there. Um, the, the last thing I want to say is, is make a little bit of a plug. I, I don't mean to dismiss a lot of the creativity that, that we do see um, both at USAID um, and among many implementers, um, both, both for-profit and non-profit. Um, but I think that one of the constraints on the ability of official donors in particular to be able to, to be able to partner well is their internal capacity to be able to think, plan, measure, and, and be able to, to actually be a smart, engaged partner rather than just a pass-through. And this is why I just want to make a plug right now. Um, as a community, there is one thing above all else we should be united in asking members of Congress for, and I think everyone should be on the Hill asking their member of Congress to support USAID operating expenses. For too often as a community, we've been out cannibalizing that 150 account, looking for our particular sector set aside. Um, I get the sense that this is changing over the last few years, but we, I think if, if we want a USAID that is actually able to engage on these issues, to, to be the kind of partner we want, we've got to be willing to support the, the basic resources for them to be able to do that and build out that capacity. Anybody want to respond to Greg? <laughs> okay, uh, get ready. Now I'll start formulating questions. I'm going to do one more quick round of questions up here and then I'm going to, you can start uh, migrating in about three minutes to the uh, microphones. And for those of you standing uncomfortably in the back of the room, there are tons of seats right up here in front. Come on down. Um, let me ask, um, uh, pick up on uh, Greg's comment about the question uh, about the Congress. Uh, is there any political will? I mean, wh why do we have such a clunky uh, 
procurement system in all governments, as far as I know, not just in the U.S. system. Uh, one of the uh, opening comments was, how does the procurement system keep up with the rapid pace of new models, new approaches? Uh, I think the grand challenges for development is maybe an interesting approach. But is there any uh, appetite around Washington for some sort of dramatic reform uh, in the um, a procurement system that would speed it up, that would increase access by more partners, and that would devolve more authority locally. What do the politics of this look like? <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Um, I'll come at that question this way. Um, I've been working on a task force under Administrator Shaw's direction with uh, Angeli Crumbly, who's um, managing the M Bureau, including OAA, um, the head of the General Counsel's Office, and a few others. And we've been trying to, we, we've pulled together a plan to try to make improvements in the procurement cycle times and things like that. And um, may, maybe we're uh, guilty of not thinking to, uh, more broadly enough, but actually we didn't spend any time of, on talking about legislative changes because we feel like there's so much that we need to do that um, we, we should work on that first and then see what are their truly intractable things. Um, you know, some of the things are more in the weeds. I mean, there have been from the, f we wrote, we talked about in that report that I mentioned and it's still true now, there are, it's very hard to uh, hire and fill vacancies in the procurement area because people all over government are looking. This is like way in the weeds, but if you don't have enough people to process, you know, that slows you down. Um, there, there are a whole host of other problems like that. And, and so we, we've been really focusing on those things. But the one other thing that I'll observe is um, I, my, my little firm was a, uh, for f in the early years of EBRD, for a couple of years, we were actually one of the bigger um, service providers from the United States to EBRD. And it was interesting to watch a brand new organization without the buildup of the FAR and all of those things and how, how it worked in the first 10 years. And in the very uh, f early years, they were an absolute dream to work with. And what I saw every year is every year, you know, what you'd have basically is that you'd have 99 out of 100 contractors, consultants doing the right thing. And every year there would be one exception that would cause a problem. And every year there would be additional rules or there'd be an additional court case that would lead to additional things. And I haven't worked with them for more than a decade, but just within the decade I'd work with them, I saw them gradually and gradually evolve to look like every other government um, development agency. So there is some part of this that it's like a shared in, uh, situation and we all have a role to play. Every time there's a protest, right? Sometimes for really, really legitimate reasons and sometimes for very legitimate maybe business reasons that don't serve the greater goal. So that's a factor, things inside organizations. So you've got this whole ecosystem um, and, and some of it I think is just the nature of government. It's not like one little legislative fix, but there are lots of things we can do, I think, collectively to improve things. Chris, uh, when the uh, I'll say delegation, <coughs> excuse me, I'll say delegation was here last August, I got the sense that the parliamentarians in Australia were quite interested in, in procurement reform. Is that the situation? Do they have a, uh, is, is there hope there to uh, uh, avoid some of the kind of perhaps inevitable bureaucratization that Eric just referred to? Well, I mean, we're certainly seeing a lot more scrutiny over the aid budget because the aid budget's growing rapidly and, and a lot of the rest of government is not. Uh, and, and it's not just um, external scrutiny from the media and the public, it's internal scrutiny from within government from our finance ministry saying, prove your results. Um, so, you know, that, that's resulting in changes in terms of, you know, us needing to make greater evidence-based decisions, uh, our need to focus more on monitoring and evaluation and proving that aid works. So, um, um, I guess that's the big context for us, uh, more so than uh, the procurement reform side. Kathleen, what do you think? Uh, you live in this world. Uh, can we make this more? I mean, I, I lived in a world uh, at AID where we created the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction to layer on top of much increased uh, internal Inspector General staff so that, you know, one could 
be a bit of a pessimist here that uh, a sort of a new, open, more agile procurement system uh, may be an ever more distant dream. What do you think? Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a significant tension um, as everybody looks for accountability, um, whether it's the Hill or, or you know, anybody else in the elected um, government, looks for accountability between the need for short-term results to justify budgets and to justify um, spending and the realization in our, in our industry and in our work that it takes a long time to get sustainable uh, results and build capacity. Um, and so I think that the procurement aspects of that are difficult. It's difficult for implementing partners um, and it's difficult for USAID, OSA, DFID, and any other donor to, to make sure that they can really respond to the different drummers um, and, and the realization of what we're trying to accomplish together. Greg, you have a comment on this one? <laughs> you, you seem to be asking all the questions today, Jim, that, that kind of invoke rants that are deep within me. <laughs> and as, a, well, as long as it's as, a short rant, yeah, you can I'll rant. Try to, I'll try to be brief. As a, as a Hill rat myself for, for 10 years, um, there's no more broken relationship in Washington between Congress and the executive branch than the relationship around global development. Um, it, one of the gratifying things over the last few years is to see actually a reinvestment um, by, by a number of members of Congress in expertise and influence over and dialogue around our, our global development agenda. Uh, but that does not, that does, it does not permeate to the whole Congress, partially because Congress hasn't authorized these programs in 30 years. And passing legislation is how members of Congress learn about, understand, and, and view accountability towards the executive branch. And that lack of any substantive legislation um, beyond you know, some riders that get tacked onto the appropriations bill has led to the vast majority of members of Congress not understanding what we're trying to do, how we're going to get there, and what success looks like. And so you're not actually able to have a, a really good dialogue amongst the vast majority of, of members of Congress. Now, again, I want um, to probably give shouts out to a few particular members of Congress who I think over the past few years have, have really dug in on this issue, starting, of course, with Frank Wolf, the, uh, the guy who whom, uh, came up with the Help Commission concept in the first place, Dick Luger, Howard Berman. Um, you've now got Ted Poe uh, and Marco Rubio moving forward with legislation on uh, uh, on transparency and, and monitoring and evaluation, which is going to be very significant legislation, seems to be the kind of thing that everybody can agree on. And maybe we can get this dialogue going again uh, about what the measures of broad measures of success look like. Uh, but I really despair of being able to have a substantive conversation with Congress on the specifics of procurement if we can't even agree what the mission is. Okay, despair, not a good place to start with the questions and answers from the audience, but uh, l let me invite you to come. I, I would ask, but if, you, if I can, I notice there's two um, former heads of procurement at USAID in the room, Tim and Mike. I don't know if you guys want to have a, something you want to start with. Uh, they, they go to the mic or grab the mic, please. Well, I intro introduce your name and organization in full transparency. My name is Tim Beans, and I am um, head of business development for IRD. And I've had the pleasure of working for other firms in uh, in the Washington area. So I've been doing development for a long time, working with Allstate also. Uh, uh, you all have. Uh, I want to thank the panel because you have generated about 40 or 50 questions that I'd like to ask. <laughs> but uh, uh, let me just kind of narrow it down to one thing. I think the panel would be surprised that most of the people in this city that have done development support theoretically the concept of uh, that Rod Shaw is trying to introduce with USAID Forward. Certainly, if companies have, I mean, countries have the ability to accept money and, and work it through government agencies and go directly to the people, then that is development. That's what we're all seeking. But a lot of the uh, countries that we're working in where they're trying to do that. Uh, a lot of us have found problems. That does not exist right now. We're dealing with corruption, we're dealing with a lot of things, and I, like Jim alluded to with the IG, we deal with the IG, cigar, GAO, and congressional inquiries constantly. 
And we should be. We're, we're stewards of taxpayer dollars. Uh, one of the things I heard on the panel is we're having 450 grants that we're receiving under, the, uh, under these new Applications. things. Applications. Applications for grants. And that's wonderful. That's a lot of competition. I had a difficult time as the head of contracts moving $14 billion through the agency. And that is one of the reasons we had to go to larger and larger procurements and why some companies became specialized at being supporters of, of development at USAID. We would love the luxury of being able to go out to the uh, thousand points of light. We couldn't move the money. And my fear is that's what's going to happen here. We hear there's a lot of money in Iraq. Uh, going back to, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, in Afghanistan, 09, 10, 11, 12, money that hadn't been obligated that they've had to move over to the World Bank. I'm not sure that that is really good for USAID. So I love the panel's thoughts on some of those concepts. And Mike, Kathleen, you, I agree with you. We, there are people doing good development work out there. So. Let me ask Mike if he has any questions, and then we'll uh, turn to the panel. Good morning. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. I'm Mike Walsh. I'm currently with DAI, the uh, Chief Ethics Compliance Officer, but also serve SID in, on, on a couple of panels on procurement reform and acquisition assistance. So I appreciate this opportunity. I would, just another aspect of this, and sort of echoing a little bit what Chris and Gregor are saying, uh, my sense is that um, real procurement reform, real changes really have got to come from the program side. It's got to drive the, 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 the definition of these procurements. Uh, in other words, uh, I w to the extent that the, the program and the way they're do doing business and such like that should impose upon the contract people who are doing the business relationship different ways of thinking and approaching things. We saw that with grants under contract. We saw the simplified assistance and such like that. We saw that with the, general, the GDAs and these other grant challenges and things. That was driven by the program, OK? So um, the procurement people, the Office of Acquisition Assistance, need to be there to sort of adjust and refine so things go faster. But real changes, real changes, whether it's defined in terms of involving the, the local beneficiaries or just trying to keep up with development, I think that's where you can start really seeing some real changes. Mike, could you just give, a, give us one concrete example of what would be a program-driven change that would achieve the kind of goals we've been talking about here um, so that the panel has something to respond to? That. For example, I, I, I think we're starting to see something interesting coming out in terms of performance-based financing where you actually have a situation where you're trying to uh, engage the beneficiaries and, and help them share in the cost of maybe public, uh, you know, their primary health care. So there has been efforts to uh, broker agreements with the beneficiaries, the government, the local government, and also the international partners in defining what is that service level agreement and how much people will contribute towards that. Okay, I mean, that, that's really engaging. Maybe there's other aspects out there, and I, I still look at things through the prism of a contracting person, but, but what you need to do is really start defining what you need to do to accomplish this development purpose, and then from there talk about uh, appropriate engagements and not and try to get beyond this sort of RFP or projectized type things. It, it's, there's a lot of elements to that. Thank you. Um, for those who don't live in this world on a day-to-day -day basis, I just want to make sure on Tim's first point, which I'm going to ask the panel to respond to, uh, many people within donor agencies managing huge budgets are faced with this very practical problem. They know that if there's Five million, five million dollars to spend, it probably could be done more creatively through 50 local partners, each of which would come up with a great uh, innovative project. The reality is the IG is looking over your shoulder and now I've got 50 organizations that could have a corruption problem, could have a management problem, and so there is a perceived tendency to say, well, I'm going to give one big $5 million grant to XYZ because we know them and, and we can assure the accountability and I'm not going to go to jail. <laughs> so, I mean, that is a, a, a real world problem that, that impedes creativity in the contracting side from my experience. So, uh, panelists, what do you think about these two interventions? Go ahead. Okay, um, I'll start on this one. Um, very good questions and points. Um, First of all, um, Tim, you're, you're absolutely right, and uh, this is a work in progress. When you start to do uh, work with smaller organizations of any type, um, there's bandwidth 
uh, challenges to that. And the Grand Challenge is is a perfect example because uh, the ed team uh, that uh, works in our bureau has found it very challenging to get those 32 grants out the door and and properly um, uh, supervise them. And and this and the OAA team, of course, felt the same way. Um, so the, the the there's a couple different things. I mean, part of that has to do with some of this streamlining work that we're we've got a it's probably multi-year process. Uh, one of the things Angelique is trying to do, for instance, is make more use of templates and other internal things. Uh, there's a whole new like tracking system, and AAs now have uh, mandatory uh, meetings where they're focused on some of this stuff and trying to streamline. So I think, and and some of these hiring things that I alluded to, there's a variety of, you know, do it more efficiently, get additional resources, but you're right, if this is a priority, you have to have the, the throughput capability. Um, but there are other approaches being uh, taken as well, and, you know, sort of allude to um, something Kathleen said that, you, you know, it, it, it is a matter of working all together, right? And there is tremendous experience in in many U.S. organizations. So you you see, for instance, that as the USAID staff are responding to um, the direction set by the president and um, secretary and and administrator Shaw on some of this USAID forward stuff, um, you you have each individual mission, contract officer, program officer, trying to figure out how to do that. And so some, for instance, are are designing things where, in essence, they're they're actually looking to share the load with some of you, right? Because I'm sure some people in this room have seen some of these these uh, RFPs that have gone out, where in essence they're they, we're looking where to the international contractor or uh, NGO to then start to identify some of the local partners and then have a switchover point. So maybe in a five-year life, in the beginning, it's much more big contractor organized and run, they have so much expertise, but then gradually trying to shift more and more to the locals and build their expertise. So I think you'll see a lot of experimentation and a lot of drawing on all the capabilities, such as Kathleen said, because you guys have a tremendous amount of experience, and that's where it becomes a shared endeavor. And then lastly, um, um, that sort of illustrates, Mike, I think part of what you're talking about, which is you have the program side also thinking through how to do this. And then like what um, what Greg was saying is talking extensively in country and understanding their systems and trying to adopt some of these program designs to r try to respond better and work better with uh, situations on the ground and how things really work there. So that would be a few comments on those questions. O other responses from the panel? Um, yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. I mean, I think, um, I think the, the challenge of the regulatory environment, the ethics and compliance environment is significant. Um, I um, am about to provide ethics and compliance training this afternoon to 75 chief of parties from around the world that have come in um, as part of our COP conference this week. Um, it's something we do all the time. It's obviously building the local capacities, understanding of the rules and regulations at USAID, OSSE, DFID, and other donors. Um, but it is a full-time job for a relatively um, large company like Apt Associates. So um, the responsibilities that are now being passed down to small businesses, to local entities, are huge. And so I, I couldn't um, reinforce Eric's comments um, more to say that bringing us together, you know, different folks together to brainstorm how this, this um, and I, I agree with Tim, you know, we're aligned behind USAID Forward. We know change is inevitable. We've got to be part of that change process. Um, but I don't think throwing the baby out with the bathwater is the right thing. It's really building on our successes and having us contribute to the innovative thinking about how to make it all successful. Um, but it's, it's tough, the IGs are, are all out there, um, and we need to be collaborative um, in that process so that we can all be successful in reaching the ultimate goal, which is impact. Chris, do you want to comment? Yeah, I guess uh, our starting point um, when we're thinking through uh, how to make the greatest impact on the ground isn't the form of aid, it's the sort of um, what what's the role that Australia can play within this particular development context drawing on, you know, what, what the people want, what the government wants. So um, I guess we sort of 
end up uh, with, a, with the form of aid once we've thought through our country strategy, which is where we make the biggest impact, where we focus our efforts, and then through uh, annual consultations with our partner government, with other stakeholders, where we sort of say, what role can we sensibly play here? And then we get to sort of form of aid where we're the contracting uh, procurement processes come in as well as other partnerships. So I guess in that context, um, uh, the more we can do to harmonise, I guess, uh, uh, in terms of how we how we work with others, uh, is healthy because um, we are working more and more with uh, in partnerships. And I think uh, you know the experience of um, uh, collectively when partnerships started happening was we needed the Paris Declaration where we sort of talked about principles through which we work together as a, a community. Well, I, I suspect a lot of that was focused on the policy side and not so much on the nuts and bolts on things like procurement. So um, certainly in the time I've been here, uh, I've noticed some very vast differences between how AusAid does procurement and how USAID does procurement. That, that may well have implications for um, partners like that. So um, I think there is an agenda there um, to think through collectively uh, how we do this uh, better. Hey Greg, are you in favor of throwing out the baby with the bathwater? <laughs> <laughs> I love babies. I think we should not throw them out with the bathwater. Um, I, I, this corruption challenge is, for us, the, the central challenge of development. Um, not just because it diverts resources that are intended to help people living in poverty, but it undermines the very accountability that we are trying to support locally. The problem is, again, it's, it's how we set up these incentives and disincentives uh, with official development assistance. And the emphasis is on compliance and risk avoidance rather than actually tackling the issue of corruption. And I think some of that, as I alluded to before, goes back to this broken relationship between Congress and the executive branch. The reason Congress asks all these tiny specific questions is that they're not bought in to the larger frame. Um, but I, I think more importantly, we do have this um, immense risk aversion. Um, and I, you know, um, Andrew Natsios wrote um, very profoundly on this subject um, a few years ago uh, in a piece for CGD. Uh, but the issue is this, is, this is a lot of the disconnect that we hear in the field from local partners and their frustration with the U.S. role as a development partner. Because for years they see the U.S. focused on avoiding corruption in their countries, and what they really want is the U.S. working with them as a partner in fighting corruption, which is a different animal altogether. And they're telling us that they actually want the United States government, these, these are people like John Gatongo in Kenya, telling us that they want the U.S. government to put a little bit of money through their own government systems so that they can track it and start to create that demand for accountability. If we're building these systems of integrity as implementers, but not actually supporting a constituency for accountability to make sure that local people actually have some skin in the game, see those funds as their funds, see the accountability as belonging to them, then we're not actually tackling the real challenge. And, and this is the, the risk with the current system where all that accountability flows back to Washington. We're missing opportunities to actually get at the larger problem. We had a question right down here, and then, uh, I'll t you know, maybe uh, if I can ask you to, I hate to be too disruptive, but to sort of line up behind the mics, because otherwise we'll never, I'll never be fair, and, I, and this way we'll get to as many people as we can, uh, but uh, I probably never, uh, we said at the beginning, by the way, before we convened the panel that given the amount of talent and given the amount of interest, we should have had a three-day workshop rather than an <laughs> hour and a half uh, panel. But, uh, okay, so there was the young lady that I just, oh, right there, you had your hand up first, uh, yes, with the white blouse on, I'm sorry, uh, because I did notice her first. She raised her hand a long time ago, okay. Hi, my name is Michelle Laird. I'm with APT Associates, and I have projects operating in developing countries. And the question I have, though, is, is regarding, in particular, USA procurement, and how, how are you balancing the various USA procurement initiatives? Um, for example, I, I know with regard to USA Forward, it depends on the country. How able is that country um, to, to 
implement projects locally? How, what, what is their depth and breadth of experience? In a recent case, I led uh, a proposal effort in which all of our subcontractors were local. They were NGOs, civil society, as well as local small businesses. And we also leveraged local private sector funding to help implement. So we brought all of that together in a local package. We had local staff, everything was local. And I received a phone call and was called to task for not having included US small businesses. So <laughs> we have a great track record of including US small businesses. Our, our subcontractor percentage for US small businesses is terrific. But I was told, but, but I need to do that on every single effort. And this was actually a country where the local capacity was terrific. There was a, a wealth of experience. So my question is, how does one, how do you balance that? May, may I ask the panel, is it okay with you if I do the three classic questions. three questions? Yeah. And, uh, and I know, I know that, that, that requires us to move expeditiously. Remembering again, that brevity is the soul of wit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a Tall order for a lawyer. So I was the lawyer for these two guys, the procurement executives of AID. Uh, Jeff Marburg Goodman, uh, currently Creative Associates, and <clears throat> recently a special counsel, the administrator of USA. Um, you know, one of my rants, and Greg has heard it many times, I just want to be build off some of the, the discussions about procurement in the last round of questions. Um, Greg has heard this, ra uh, this rant before, and I did it when I was within the, the government as an appointee and since leaving, is that it's not going to be good enough to run, fund, be very simple about this, run funding through uh, other developing country systems and through local NGOs without a very robust plus up in our governance funding. I, if we have problems with procurement here, you can imagine <laughs> the pro problems, and I saw it because we, we did a country system assessments all over the world, and I was on those teams when we actually assessed uh, country uh, government systems and procurement, financial management, the whole range of financial management of institutions. So what I'm, my question is, what are the thoughts about plussing that up? Governance has always been, the, I always say, governance has been the, the poor sister to democracy and the democracy and governance spec spectrum, which has been the poor sister to everything else. All the sexy topics, of course, have champions on the Hill. Where are our champions about this most basic uh, need that's gonna make everything else possible? Please. Okay, it's hard to be short, but um, name uh, name and organization. Betsy Basson, Panagora Group, and I've worn a number of hats, including president of SID, helping to form uh, the uh, Council of International Development Companies, and currently uh, chair of the Small Business Association of International Contractors. And you know, I guess I'm inspired to stand up because I feel we inhabit different worlds. And I think it's so important for us to actually recognize that because when you describe what you think the world of international companies is, for an example, and I've also worked in international NGOs, it's not the same one that we recognize. And the um, colleague from App described actually a world that I understand a lot more closely as describing our world, where we have large projects or small projects. We work extremely interwoven in the local national infrastructure with people at community levels through NGOs that already are working with those communities. If you want to fund 50 organizations, look at the projects you already have. It is amazing what is going on with grants under contracts and local subcontracting. And you have people who every day are working as part of their job to make sure the compliance to US government regulations are being met. And I think, you know, if we go back to say, okay, what happened under procurement reform? <laughs> Unfortunately, the 40% that stays with the international implementing partner did not get sufficient scrutiny. And what I'd like to suggest is we don't actually know how good it was, which is not to say it was perfect. But there's an amazing amount of local development occurring within what USAID has done for a really long time and continues to do, and it only gets better with just so many of the themes resonating in these projects that you want, like the shifting, the building of capacity and the shifting of capacity. 
So what are some suggestions? Some suggestions are that we really need to open up communication. I think that USAID is very um, uh, alone in the US government tapestry in not having good communication with its partners. That it has become, unfortunately, um, captive to procurement integrity. So it feels it can't have this open communication. That doesn't exist with other government agencies and its implementing partners. And to appreciate what you have as well as constructively look at it. A lot of verbiage, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that I would suggest is, hey, has everyone eaten at Nando's? Who's no. eaten at Nando's? <laughs> yeah. Do you know that Nando's was started under a USAID project in the 90s called Black Integrated Commercial Support Network? It was started actually through a project that had a small business that specialized in franchising and helped it come to be. We just don't recognize these successes. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Now, those are three questions we could have <coughs> taken up the whole panel, but. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. Passion is okay. Passion in procurement is a good thing. All right. Uh, okay. Why don't we start on this end? You want me to start? Okay. Um, you can answer any yeah. one of them, uh, all three of them. Uh, just let me let, let me let me take two of them. I want to answer Betsy's question and and, and Jeff's question. Um, let, let me maybe start with with Jeff's. Um, I absolutely agree. We have underinvested in the question of governance governance broadly. Uh, I think part of the problem is there's a confusion amongst, um, well, I'll say particularly on Capitol Hill, I think, um, between governance and democracy promotion. And democracy promotion, of course, a frame that even the democracy groups aren't using anymore. They're talking about democracy development. Um, so there's a, I, I think there's really an old, um, almost Cold War vision of what, um, of what governance work looks like um, among many of the people who are responsible for determining funding levels and we need to we need to work to change that because absolutely that is where that is how we're going to get to the the kind of scale up of of outcomes that i think we need to actually get to this goal of eradicating global poverty but i, I think that gets me the the answer to to betsy's question because i think we're we're conflating two different questions here the question is not whether or not the community of global development implementers has been doing great work for many, many years. We see evidence of this all over the place. Terrific projects, nonprofit projects, for-profit projects, <laughs> programs. There, there's a lot of really good outcomes from this. The question is not whether or not there's good work being done. The question is whether we as a community are doing enough or tackling the right questions to be able to get us to this transformational goal of eradicating poverty. And I think there are very few people in this room that would agree that we're even close yet. We need to change what we're doing if we're going to actually have significantly greater impact than what we've had up to this point. And th this specifically gets to, again, some of these questions of governance in that the types of things that the global donor community and, and the United States government in particular is investing in are only very slowly coming around to the types of things that we hear that local stakeholders actually need and want. There's a lot of, there's a great legacy, we believe, of USAID-supported interventions in developing countries that still aren't tackling those real questions. And of course, corruption, as I've mentioned before, gets to the heart of one of them. We've still got a system that is built to avoid corruption rather than fight it head on. And that's something that people are clamoring for. Um, and again, to, to USAID's credit, that's one of the things we see starting to emerge, starting to emerge from, from the way they're thinking and the way they're approaching things. But it's still very slow and cautious and not meeting the, the, the clamor that we're hearing out there. Kathleen. Um, I'm, I'm just going to build on this for one second um, and recuse myself from Michelle's questions and some of the others, but um, I would say the, the emphasis on monitoring and evaluation can help here, um, not just to justify the expenditures, but more to determine what works and what doesn't work. So I think your point is a very good one. I, I agree with Betsy in the sense that 
um, we tend to be so preoccupied on um, making local businesses primes and, and not thinking about the amount of investment that's already underway. But I do agree with you that we need to determine what's working and what isn't working. And so the question I'd have you know, for my um, colleagues at the table is, is there um, a real commitment to monitoring and evaluation? Will there be resources there? Is that something that, you know, like other agencies in the U.S. government, where there's been significant resources put to that to really determine what works and what doesn't work, um, is it is it going to be there? Chris? Yeah. Well, I, I think from our perspective, certainly at the at the headline level, we are very committed to getting investing more in to determining what works and what doesn't, and and having more evidence based approaches. But I think we you know one of the challenges for us and for all donors is ensuring, as I said at the start, making sure that our procurement practice keeps pace with that and making sure we're building enough monitoring and evaluation into designs and into programs. So <laughs> I think we do have a legacy issue there, but I think we're committed to that. And I just want to say on the governance issue, um, as a donor, we invest very heavily in governance, partly because um, we're surrounded by fragile states in the Asia Pacific and there's a lot of um, governance challenges uh, there. But uh, certainly from our perspective, um, when you're better off working through a partner system and putting lots of checks and balances around that and trying to reform the system than you are sort of pretending the system's not there and creating a parallel system and working in isolation. I think our experience shows working in isolation doesn't work in terms of um, long-term impact. I mean, you might, you, in the short term, you're protecting your dollars. In the long term, you're not having an impact on what matters for development. Uh, so uh, certainly, um, we, we recognise that uh, you know we we can't um, tolerate corruption in our programs, but w but we find a way to work through systems um, with lots of checks and balances along the way, auditors in place. This is a role for where certainly contractors play a very heavy um, role in our programs. Um, but but ignoring the system is is not a recipe for long term success. Sure. Michelle, nice to see you again. Long time. Um, so um, I'm really glad you brought that um, up. It's, um, y you know, as people try to embark on a, little th a lot of things and just symptomatic of the, of the entire development agenda with, uh, what is it, Greg, hundreds <laughs> of goals, <laughs> and then you have, here, here's a case study. I don't, uh, on that specific one, I don't have an answer, but it's, I'm really glad you brought it up. I'm going to bring it back to the building. Obviously, we have to deconflict some of those things and give clear signals. I mean, we're, we're dedicated to both, right? And, and but the, the question is completely legitimate, which is, okay, but we need clear signals about the relationship between some of these. So I'm um, eager to hear a little bit more so I can take back. And, you know, that's clearly something that we have to, those kinds of issues and, and picking up uh, a little bit on what Betsy said is that's why this communication is so important because we, we've got to, you know, learn and pick up on these kind of things where there are problems and then get good communications back. So other than that broad thing right now, I don't have an answer, but it, clearly that's not good enough. That, that kind of strain ac across multiple objectives. We are trying to do more um, with small businesses, domestic and international, but ho wh how to set, get it all um, set and in sync is, is something we clearly should work on. Um, Jeff, uh, you know I agree. Um, it's been interesting coming to government, and as some of you may know, the E3 Bureau is the technical lead on, depending on how you count, somewhere between 12 and 14 of the approximately 18 sectors in which we work on development. And people come to my office regularly, different um, um, advocacy groups, and I've started um, saying to them when they say how they want a big increase in that area, well, what would you like me to cut? What would you like the administration to cut? And literally people start laughing. They laugh. It's like, well, seriously, that's what we have to do here. And everybody wants their massive plus up in all these areas. But the two areas that have no advocacy groups, I'd add one to your list, EG and DG, there's no advocacy around those things. And to your list on governance, I actually have my personal one, um, which, which is even more sort of wonky and in the weeds, hi, Sean, um, mm -hmm. is um, tax administration because actually local systems and local mm -hmm. solutions doesn't work in the long run if the host country doesn't have the resources to pay for those things. 
And in the long run, Secretary Clinton was very eloquent about this as she, when she was Secretary of State. But um, the building of local um, tax revenues, I think, is a big part of graduation and the whole endeavor. And talk about not having much of an advocacy group for that one. That's <laughs> definitely up there um, in our country and overseas. Um, and, and so um, I, lastly on the communications, um, I'll just speak for my bureau. I, I agree that there's more that can be done. In our case, um, I haven't, uh, we every six months have ha started having open houses for want of a better term. Um, and the next one will be in July. I don't have the date yet, but um, if you're, you can always email me, epostel at usaid.gov. But we, this will be the third one. But what we've started doing is um, we, we have all the office directors there. We have a session where we talk a little bit about what we're trying to do or some topics, do some Q&A, and then have a chance for everybody to talk to two or three different people from every single office and let you have those and have those interactions, let them hear from you. It's just one, I think there's probably more things we can do, but it's one thing that we sort of self-invented to try to have this dialogue regularly and we've surveyed after e each of the first two to write down to, we know that people prefer to have them on Tuesday mornings <laughs> um, and how frequently in the whole thing because we're really, I, I, for my part, I really want to have that dialogue and, and make sure that we're not shuttered in. And yes, there's all those procurement integrity things that get um, drilled into us, but I, I think there's still things we can do to have those dialogues. Ma'am. My name is Martin Leni. I'm the Director of Project Management at RBI International. This is a small woman-owned business firm. Uh, I just want to respond first to Gregory's comment about uh, why we are not fighting corruption. I think what I've noticed in many countries I've worked with, especially working with local government entities, is that it's difficult to fight corruption without infringing on the sovereignty of the country. I've worked in many places where the, the government officials will actually tell me, if you want to give me your money, you let me manage it my own way, the way our government functions. Mm -hmm. But if you want me to comply with your regulation, take your money back. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the question of the cost of compliance, not only for small businesses, but also to local uh, small NGOs and other organizations that want to work with USAID. Most of us cannot afford the uh, ethics and compliance officers or that kind of training that Kathleen's going to do this afternoon because procurement comes with plug figures in many instances where you cannot spend more than 10% on administration and operation. You cannot do this, you cannot do that. How do we stay compliant with no money behind it? Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> right here. Uh, Eric Boyle from uh, ICF International, and uh, this is a great panel, and I hope that CIDC and SID and others continue the dialogue so we're not talking about this only once a year. Um, and I think this open dialogue is excellent. I want to piggyback on the issue of, um, uh, on the trade-off between the multiple objectives of procurement reform. And what I'm hearing from folks here is basically it's accountability is one, basing decisions on evidence is the other, uh, creating efficiencies is, is a third, and then country ownership and sustainability is the fourth. And um, well, this is e and these are all often conflicting with each other, so I'd like to put the panel on the spot and ask of those four drivers, which are the most important? You cannot use Mike's cop out and say that it's due to the programmatic objectives of specific programs, but really in, in order and when establishing priorities, because either programs are gonna be really long and expensive, or they're gonna be really short and ineffective. So I'd be curious, and, and not the program, sorry, the actual procurement of the services or of this is gonna be either really long and expensive if you're looking for accountability, or really short and ineffective if you're looking for efficiency. So I'd be eager to hear did that. The, did the panel capture no, all your four you choices? Give, give us those four choices again, A, B, C, D. Number one, they're all, they all are A, B, C, D. Um, a, accountability. B, base decisions on evidence. C, creating efficiencies and D, uh, development, sustainability, and ownership. So there, there are A, B, C, D. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Carmen Streigel, RTI International. I would like to go back on the issue of the All um, Children Reading Challenge. Um, we actually mentored a number of local organizations putting in an application um, to this competition. Um, and one of the gaps that we have seen uh, across the developing world is they had nowhere to go to. They had nowhere to go to to get answers to their questions. There wasn't really a lot of a 
you know, communication system around how I'm actually supposed to fill out these forms. A lot of these organizations have fantastic ideas and they have built a strong track record in their own countries, but not filling out these kind of forms. And they were very simplified already. It was a big effort, but there was most of all no resource they could tap into to get that support. And that speaks for anything, for OSA procurements, for USAID procurements through other vehicles. Where do they go? To get an independent um, type of support information center. You know, I work in a small Pacific Island country. Yeah, that government can handle its own procurement <laughs> most of the time. Um, there is no advice for organizations. So even us as the larger organizations, shepherding them, supporting them through our projects, um, you tend to get the usual suspects, even as local organizations that have a track record already having worked with a certain donor, they have their systems and their forms together. So you're yet excluding another group that could potentially be in this because it's so incredibly hard for them to, to wrap their head around that. And then one comment about monitoring and evaluation, same story. Many of these organizations have never in their lives done anything that sounds like monitoring and evaluation, all right? They do not have the expertise to understand what's part of those concepts. So here they are now with these grants and are supposed to evaluate them. What stories are you gonna get out of 32 grants if they don't know how to write their story? What indicators to measure, how to measure them, how that data is reliable, how it's being analyzed? So I, I worry about that um, and making these things in absence then of having systems in place to support them. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I should have said this earlier, but both uh, Chris and Eric reminded me at the beginning that they are not procurement professionals, <laughs> experts per se. They're representing their respective agencies, but uh, these are, and, and again, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I mean, these are questions that you're asking mm -hmm. great questions and we could spend a lot of time, but let me ask, uh, the audience in the hopes of getting one more quick round in uh, to, to respond, at least initially, to these excellent points. Uh, great questions. Vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the comments about all children reading, well, I think I heard the makings of a good business plan in there um, mm -hmm. for somebody to, to do those kinds of services, but I'll certainly th take back to our team, to, and, and you know, I'm sure Osaid will be thinking about this as well, as okay, when we design the grand challenges, um, are there some things we should do on our side? I don't think we necessarily have to provide all of those um, services, but there may be some things that we should be doing better on. Um, monitoring and evaluation also to weave in, because I, I never really spoke to um, Kathleen's. I, I think that um, we're very serious about monitoring and evaluation, and I think that it goes across the board. There's a lot of experience. In fact, I would bet, I've not done any study, but I bet right now that um, monitoring and evaluation experts are probably seeing salaries rise and finding all kinds of job offers um, uh, left and right because they're in short supply. It's a, it's a new, evolving field. For our part within the organization, we're, uh, it's just our bureau alone, we're very focused on trying to improve and increase our capabilities, and we're not all the way there. I would not claim that it's a finished work, and then I know that that's really true in a lot of different organizations. I, I think that you know people, as they, you know, having been in private sector, you look at your, the, the, the environment in which you're operating, back to the thing that Kathleen was asking about at the very beginning, so how is the world changing and how do we need to respond, and I think that's part of the thing that people will identify like, well, if we're serious about this business, we've got to learn about a monitoring evaluation. Now, I, I know, as having been a small business and literally started in the basement of my house, um, that um, what it's like to do that, but people do it, and there's a, probably a lot of smaller size businesses have that done that, and, and so it is, it is possible. Um, in terms of the four multiple objectives, um, I, I think I, I mean I, I know you want one, but I just I don't I don't agree that it's just one. I, I think that when I look at that list of four, they're all very important. Um, the one thing that I would say, and I'm really interested in efficiency and those mm -hmm. who follow some of the the things that our bureau has been trying to do would would see the evidence of that. The one thing that I would put subservient to the other three is efficiency needs to be efficiency and service of a lot of other more important goals. So I would never put efficiency ahead of you know, having accountability, doing evidence-based programming, having programs that are sustainable, but we, if those are the top-line goals, then I and would be asking my teams to make sure that it is, it is as efficient as possible. But efficiency for its own sake, no, I, I wouldn't put that at the top of the list. So that's a couple of, of things. 
Yeah. So I guess starting starting where Eric left off, I think we 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 would try. We wouldn't see those those as necessarily trade offs within our system. And I guess we're, we're trying to introduce reforms into our procurement practice to try and hit as many of those notes as we can within our system. So for instance, we've just done a advisory services standing offer where a whole lot of companies, uh, including some in this room, have been. Uh, put on on uh, three-year contracts to basically provide advisory services uh, at very short notice whenever they're needed for designs or for technical assistance in our countries. So we've got a more complex model, I guess, than we used to have. In recognition, it's a more complex world and a more complex business model we've have, we have, and we're trying to get all those elements in there. And I guess just on the um, example of... Um, of the, the capacity issues around local organisations. Again, I think that's part of the evolution of where we're hoping, um, you know, uh, the whole ecosystem, I think as it's called here, uh, will head because I think we see great opportunities for Australian companies who may have used to just work with AusAid to start working with partner governments in our, in our um, countries and with local NGOs. Uh, and certainly international NGOs quite often work with local NGOs in countries. So, um, rather than just uh, you know having these companies work for AusAid, there's no reason from our perspective why they can't work for a broader range of stakeholders. Um, you know, trying to achieve the same means, and certainly building local capacity is one of those areas. Just a couple of um, quick comments with respect to the organisational capacity building comments that were made. Um, I just wanted to to note that um, USAID actually built into a contract of ours in the Dominican Republic the requirement that we stand up a uh, standalone organization at the end of it. And we did a non build a nonprofit organization. Um, and one of the key questions, and those of you who know how often small businesses fail, um, the key questions that we posed to USAID was, how are we going to make this organization sustainable long term unless we can provide the mentoring and support long term? to make that happen. I met with the head of the mission in, in January, and I was made aware of actually some resources that are available, and I don't know that they're widely known, for local organizations to get about business planning and finance management and that kind of thing. So in addition to the implementing partners who can obviously help in that realm, there apparently are some USAID resources, um, and we've managed to put folks in touch with those and, um, you know, hopefully make a, a good success story about over that. Um, and just, you know, in addition, I would circle back to my comments earlier in, in relation to the ethics and compliance um, questions that were raised. Um, we are all in mid-size and large organizations standing up ethics and compliance groups because we have to. Um, but, it, but you guys need to determine the best way to use us because we're your partners. If that's, rather than have everybody at every level stand up an ethics and compliance organization, maybe we work more closely with your folks on that issue as you come out and you test us a little bit. You know, are we, are we delivering the right messages? Are we doing it consistently enough? Is it effective? Um, and then think about how, what role we play with you in, in the goals and objectives that you set out. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually got a, a pretty clear answer, I think, for the question of prioritizing those four principles, I would say ownership is absolutely should be paramount. From ownership, you get the accountability, you get the sustainability. And I would actually put less emphasis on the innovation and efficiency. Um, innovation because a lot of times um, there's already local expertise about how to define the problem and how to find a solution to it. So, it, you know, an innovative solution is not always necessary. Um, a lot of times. It's, it, it's valuable, but in some cases, we already know what the problem is. It just requires some, some brute force. Um, the efficiency, though, uh, and to just echo what, <laughs> what Eric had said, um, efficiency is one that I think we, we tend to, from the, looking at the question of efficiency through a Washington lens, it often gets warped into a very simple equation. Dollars over people times time equals efficiency. Note that results aren't a part of that equation mm -hmm. at all. And too often we have these definitions of efficiency that are focused on shoveling the money out the door as fast as you can, 
um, with, with losing as little of it and not factoring the results into it. Uh, this is, you know, and just to, to go back a little bit and, and ding the Al Gore reinventing government initiative, um, which, which we ascribe as having hollowed out UNCID to a large extent, that you do have, it, it, we had turned it into a contracting agency rather than a development agency. So I think that's, that's just an important point. That said, um, compliance needs to get simpler. And this addresses, I think, a, a couple of questions here. Um, if we're actually going to work with a wider array of partners, we've got to find ways to make this process simpler. Uh, and that's, that's been one of the promises, I think, that's been made um, as the rollout of USAID Forward has gone forward. Uh, we're not getting a lot of pickup that that's really happening. Uh, it was intended to first make things simpler for local partners and then kind of reverse engineer some of that to make it um, simpler as well uh, for a broader array of U.S. and international partners. Uh, but we, we just haven't seen that process move as quickly as it needs to. But ultimately, this gets to a question of um, focusing on what constraints exist locally. And I'm thinking about the, the question about the, the small Pacific Island where you work. You know, if, and I'm, I'm going to switch to a hypothetical here. If you're working in a country with weak government procurement systems and you're working on a malaria control project where the government doesn't have the systems to be able to procure pharmaceuticals after the project is over, maybe that's the wrong project. Maybe we're investing in the wrong thing here. And that's really the question to ask. Not how do we keep doing what we're doing where there are weak systems. How do we help those systems to not be weak? And, and again, we're, we're just not, I think, shifting enough of our thinking in that in terms of making those, trying to figure out what is the real binding constraint here and focusing our, our time, energy, and attention to that. And I think it does go back again to the, the disinvestment in, in governance. Um, and systems. Finally, um, I just I want to really quickly talk about the sovereignty question, um, because I think when when you've got a compliance issue, and we I mean this is this is an issue that we're facing, trying to support um, civil society in a lot of countries where space is restricting. You know, this is the question via these recent convictions in Egypt. Um, who is local? Uh, if locals receiving U.S. money are, are receiving U.S. money, are they really local? Do they have a nefarious intent? Um, I got to tell you, you know, Hun Sen gets a lot of mileage out of saying publicly, there are 6,000 NGOs in Cambodia and we don't know what the heck they're doing. We have to get them under control. That resonates with the Cambodian people. And it's been one of the big challenges pushing back on this NGO law. So, the, but, the, but the question is, to what extent can we, can we indigenize that question of accountability? and compliance to the extent where it becomes harder and harder for those resisting the accountability to label it as foreign. I think that's the real challenge, and I don't have simple answers for it, but it's, it's I think, the direction we need to move in in order to get around um, the, the, the challenge that you're laying out. While Greg and uh, Eric do not want to prioritize efficiency, SID <laughs> does. <laughs> <laughs> my well, timekeeper <laughs> down here has been flashing the big red stop sign for several minutes. So I am deeply sorry that I can, we cannot take more questions. And I would, if you, if you would, the panelists would please look at these gentlemen who have been waiting humbly for a long time. And I, I deeply apologize. I, you know, the sure sign of a great panel is that people want more, and it's really hard to end the panel. And so I hope you will uh, join me in expressing our appreciation to this really great program. I, I took down some action items. I mean, mm -hmm. I think congressional bill, you know, there was a broad consensus that we need to do more work with the Congress. I think there is a broad sense from a number of speakers that we need to clarify our priorities because we want a lot of people to do a lot of different things, small business, local business. And I last third and final point I took was that this, di this dialogue needs to continue mm -hmm. on the role of the uh, current partners and the new partners. And I think there was a broad consensus that that should go forward as well. With that, let me express my personal appreciation for this fascinating panel and adjourn. <laughs>